I'm Ellie Parenti and your host for tonight's 2020 Deborah Cass Prize for Writing. And yes, it's Zoom time again, and we are all virtual in body, but not in spirit. And I am speaking to you from my bedroom, come study, come hide out in Castlemaine, Jarra country. And we acknowledge the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and recognize their continuing connection to the land and the waters within and around it. Deborah Cass and I were born in the same year, 1960. And both of us were raised by full on lefty migrant background parents. I first met Deborah when she came to my high school for a few weeks, just a few weeks before she decided on a more artistic experimental school, more chaotic, but more fun, I'm sure. But she did make an impression on me, even in those few moments. And it was admiration and curiosity at first sight. She was so self-contained. I was an extrovert oversharer, no wonder I became an actress and later a memoir writer. She was still and thoughtful, clever, beautiful, and she had the best dark, long, wavy hair I had ever seen. I did meet her again a number of times later in life through mutual friends and uh, family connections, and my admiration for her never wavered. Spookily, her sister Naomi came to Castlemaine to my hometown recently to take up the directorship of the gallery here. And so we've reconnected again. Now with the common experience of having both lost our younger sisters within the same three years. I would hear updates of Deborah's widely admired work as an academic lawyer, writer and teacher. And now here I am hosting the sixth year of the award virtually granted in her honor. And thank you to those who got it started, no mean feat, and to writing prizes like this one. I, I was actually one of the long list judges this year and I was so impressed, so moved and entertained in turn by so many of the submissions that, and I know this is a bit of a cliche, but it really was hard to whittle them all down to 20 on a long list. Just quickly, briefly, just to give you an idea of tonight's program, how it will run. So firstly, Dan Cass, uh, Deborah's brother and chair of the prize committee will speak of Deborah and the history of the prize. And next across to Perth, to hear from one of our former prize winners, Rafif Ismail. Then to our special guest speaker, Philip Sands in Britain. And finally, we'll introduce you to this year's nine shortlisted writers and to Lee Kaufman, one of this year's judges and who will speak, she'll speak about the winning entries. She'll announce the two runners up and declare our 2020 winner. So again, welcome to everyone. And now over to you, Dan. Thank you, Ellie. Uh, uh, I'm uh, zooming in from Melbourne and I acknowledge the traditional owners of the country from whence I Zoom virtually, the Wiradjuri <laughs> people of the Kulin Nation, and I acknowledge sovereignty was never ceded and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. And I support the Uluru statement from the heart and a referendum to achieve justice, recognition and respect for First Nations people who own this land. So Deborah, as Ellie said, did have big wavy hair. It might be the first thing and the last thing anyone <laughs> remembers and notices about my sister. It was prodigious in, in the hippie 70s. She was a brilliant, passionate, a compelling international lawyer and writer on many areas of law. In fact, she was a feminist and a, a, a fighter for justice. Uh, she died in 2013. Uh, but along with her big love of law and justice, she loved words and stories and literature. And towards the end of her life, she returned to writing fiction. And so when Deborah died, it was my mother who had the thought that one way to honor her, in addition to various legal tributes around the world uh, to her work and memory, would be a prize to honor emerging writers from migrant backgrounds in this country. Our grandparents had been migrant uh, Jewish emigres from Europe, Jewish Poles and Russians who came here for a better life. And I, I don't think always saw themselves and their stories reflected in Australian culture, their loved new land. 
and what we offered with our prize from a modest beginning was a package that would help writers get into print. So it consists of $3,000 for the winner and then a mentorship for three months with an established writer, in most cases, a, a migrant writer in our, in our prizes case. And then we present the finished manuscript to Black Ink, wonderful publishers for consideration. And the winner of the first year, Moreno Givanoni, has his book out on Black Ink and it's been received incredibly well here and in other countries. Now, of course, many people give a, a lot of time and effort to make this happen. So I will quickly thank the many, many people who've done so much to make us, uh, to bring us here in our sixth year again. Firstly, major donors, the Hart Foundation, Professors Cheryl Kerno, uh, Cheryl, Kerno, Cheryl Cern, Saunders and Jenny Morgan, uh, dear friend of Deborah's. Philippe Sands, very dear friend of Deborah's, thank you for all uh, speaking tonight. Ellie, our host. The judges this year, Melanie Cheng, an alumni of the prize and an incredible writer. Lee Kaufman and Sasonke Nisimung, who people may have seen on the uh, wonderful webinar we had recently um, for the prize. The long list judges, thank you for all your work reading a very long list of over a hundred entries. The mentors who uh, help our writers bring their manuscripts to uh, consideration by Black Ink. Our photographer in residence, David Patston, uh, Tanya Patston fundraiser extraordinaire. Our incredible committee who work uh, as an amazing team to make this all happen every year, raise the money and put the events on. Helen Stitt, Carolyn Jordan, Vic Miles, Kevin Murray, thank you. Mascara Literary Review, our publishing partners. Writers Victoria, who host the application process, and of course, Black Ink. But most of all, dear writers who enter and bear your souls, uh, I really am in awe of the incredible intelligence, the courage and the creativity you put into telling your stories. They are just compelling. And uh, to the winner and all who enter, I trust we will see many of you published in the years ahead, without any doubt. Now it gives me great pleasure to introduce a past winner and uh, amazing writer and, and, and uh, thinker, uh, Rafif Ishmael from Perth, over to you uh, to talk a bit about our incredible alumni and the great work they do. Thank you so much, Dan. Hi, everyone. Um, Kaya and Mwanju, um, I would like to acknowledge that I am on the sovereign Buja of the Wajak Noongar people and to pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. Um, and to any First Nations people who are watching this broadcast or that this webinar might reach. Um, as a refugee, I find it really important that um, we acknowledge that, yeah, we are here on stolen land. Um, we live, we learn, we write, we heal, we create on the land, um, on the lands where stories have been told for 80,000 plus years. Um, so today I'm gonna to be sharing with you some highlights from our alumni um, who've done some fantastic things, um, especially in the past year, uh, which was so hard for creatives. Um, so for me, winning the 2017 Deborah Cass Prize actually felt like a dream. It was my second ever creative prize. Um, and it felt even more surreal when I not only gained an award, but an ever growing community of passionate and dedicated individuals. I feel so tremendously grateful and have absolutely no doubt that the effects of the Deborah Cass Prize will reverberate, reverberate throughout my entire career. Um, I know that this is a case for other winners and shortlisted writers from previous years. There are some amazing stories like um, Ideta Mujik, who um, Ideta is particularly proud of her writing achievements as she didn't start speaking English until her thirties and isn't professionally trained as a writer. Ideta, wrote to Dan Cass that it's the sheer love for writing and telling stories that has slowly brought me to, to this. This year, Edith has published a story, been shortlisted in a short story competition, and is about to approach her publisher with a manuscript for her memoir, which is so utterly brilliant. So many others continue to publish enterprises and participate in Writers' Festival. Just this year, um, Jenny Mazaraki, who was shortlisted in 2017, told us that she's been shortlisted for no less than three awards, wow, and has commenced a PhD in creative writing. Mm -hmm. um, Eileen Mose, 
who was shortlisted in 2018, has published two pieces um, in national and international magazines. And I mentioned community earlier. Sometimes the prize has some unexpected benefits. For Emily's son, who was the 2018 runner up, it was meeting with Mariana Sheik, another shortlisted writer after the Deborah Cass Awards in 2018. Um, Emily's from Perth and Mariana's from Brisbane, and they became great friends and writing buddies. Um, Emily says that her poetry collection, which is due out from Fremantle Press in 2021, wouldn't have made it to the publishers without the support of Mariana. She's from Brisbane. We're both in our early 40s. We have similar sense of humor and we really clicked and kept in contact. We've supported each other since then. She's the one who pushed me to submit to the publishers. And the incredible Melanie Chung, whose novel Room for a Stranger was shortlisted for the 2020 New South Wales Multicultural Awards in the New South Wales Premier Literary Awards and long listed for the Miles Franklin Awards. Her short story collection, Australia Day, um, which was shortlisted for the Deborah Cass Prize in 2015, received development funding from Screen Australia for a six part TV series to be written by Alison Bell and Nikki Akin and produced by Revolver Films. And we also want to extend our deepest congratulations to Jessie Chu, who was a runner up in 2017. She's a third of our winners and runner, runners up to have a novel published. Jessie's first novel, A Lonely Girl is a Dangerous Thing, was published by Alan and Unwin in June and has been met with strong acclaim. I know this because my book club has been raving about this novel for weeks. Like it's on a wait list of 20 people in our local library. Um, Alice Pang described it as a bombshell of a book and Jessie says that having her writing praised by the 2017 judges Christos Tolkos, Tony Ayres and Alice Pang motivated her to pursue her writing ambitions. It's a simple validation from another reader, especially a famous one, that says you matter, your writers matter, your writing matters and that's what, that's what the award gave me. So we can never underestimate the change that representation makes. To be seen, to be heard, and to be understood is a powerful and, free, and freeing force for positive change. And that's what the Deborah Cass Prize does. Storytelling in whatever form it takes is an act of courage. And sometimes we make ourselves vulnerable, yet through that vulnerability, we open pathways for empathy, understanding, further conversations, and change. For everyone who submitted this, their work this year, congratulations on taking such a brave step and welcome to this brilliant community. Thank you, Ravif. And now to our special guest speaker tonight, Philippe Sands. Philippe Sands is a, a British and French lawyer and author. He's professor of laws and director of the Centre on International Courts and Tribunals at University College London with a specialty of international law. He's acted as counsel and advocate in many high profile international law cases. Uh, Philip's written 17 books on international law and his book East West Street explores his own family history and the Nuremberg, Nuremberg trials. His latest book is The Rat Line, Love, Lies and Justice on the, trial, on the Trail of a Nazi Fugitive. Once asked what author or book he thinks is most underrated, Philip said Leonard Cohen, not a spare word written, spoken or sung, confidently self-deprecating, expressively individualistic, opening of the imagination, humorous. Philippe was a, a dear friend of Deborah's and tonight he's with us from Britain. Welcome Philippe, over to you. Thank you so much, Ellie. I have to say, I find it incredibly moving to be in on this conversation. Um, I'm thinking first and foremost about Deborah and how she would imagine uh, imagining her watching this and how extraordinarily proud I think she would feel um, because this prize and all who've worked on it, um, it captures so much about the spirit of Deborah, her inclusiveness, um, her desire to break down barriers, her warmth, her generosity of spirit, her accommodation of people from all backgrounds. And um, it's to her first and foremost that I think. But of course, being on this call this morning to honor the wonderful contributors to the Deborah Cass Prize 2020, those who submitted, those who were shortlisted, the future winner, 
it's an extraordinary thing you have done to join this community. Um, and it's a community uh, which is a broad community. First and foremost in that community, of course, is the family. It's wonderful to imagine Moss and Shirley, Deborah's parents watching um, this broadcast, um, Rosa and Hannah uh, and Gary uh, and Naomi. And Dan, I just listened to you and your uh, eloquence and warmth uh, in introducing this prize. Um, what an amazing thing this prize is. Um, it's now six years old. Uh, we've heard from Rafif the extraordinary reach the prize has had, um, its catalytic effect. And we all know how important writing is. I know that because I too, um, like Deborah and Dan and Naomi, am the child uh, of a refugee and uh, a person who at a very young age was separated from her parents for five years, my mother, uh, and placed in a hidden space uh, until the Second World War was over. And I know from personal experience what the legacy of that experience is for someone who has been through that kind of trauma and displacement. And to listen to Rafif just now and see with my own eyes and my own ears to hear what writing has done. Writing opens the imagination. Writing takes you into a space which allows you to think and reflect on your place in the world, but also to touch and reach others. It's a uniquely intimate experience. It's a uniquely personal experience. And we know from time immemorial that those who migrate those who move from one place to another very often tell their stories and those stories accumulate. And with that accumulation comes a number of things. It comes a sense of belonging, comes a sense of identity, comes a sense of memory, but also as Rafif said, comes that sense of legitimacy, that sense of belonging. And I think that's one of the things this prize has done so extraordinary well. It has created a community uh, of individuals who happen to write, who feel that they are recognized, which they are, that they belong, which they do, and that they are legitimated. A few days ago, I was in Nuremberg uh, in the famous courtroom 600. It was the 75th anniversary of the opening day of the Nuremberg trial. Uh, and a number of people gathered under the leadership of the president of Germany, Mr. Steinmeier, uh, to mark what happened on that day, the 20th of November, 1945. And I was very privileged to be invited to that event. Uh, and there was a panel, short panel session. Uh, and in the course of that panel session, I shared my own feelings about being in that courtroom in Nuremberg, in Germany. And I went back 75 or 80 years uh, to a moment I've often thought about, which I think all of those who've contributed to this prize this year and over the past five years, and all the shortlisted writers in this year's prize must also have thought about it, back to where they came from, back to their forebears, back to that source of initial identity. And I went back to a day in 1942 in the city of Vienna in Austria and imagined the day on which two of my great grandmothers were rounded up and were transported to a foreign place where in fact they perished. And I shared with the audience in Nuremberg last week, a question I might have put to those two elderly ladies who were being transported to a far away and distant place. Could you ever imagine that in 75 years time, a great grandchild of yours, the grandchild of migrants, uh, would be invited by the president of the country that is today persecuting you uh, to look back on what has happened and to commemorate the idea of justice. No, of course, they could never have imagined that. And just listening to Rafif and reading some of the entries from this year, that sense of connection with other places, that sense of connecting to who you are, and then that sense of putting words on a piece of paper, whether it's by hand, whether it's typewritten, 
and connecting that experience in a myriad of different ways. It could be fiction, it could be nonfiction, it could be poetry, it could be a song, it could be a blog. That act of writing, that act of connection with who we are and where we come from. And then that sense of hope, which is what I experienced last week in Nuremberg's courtroom 600, that it is possible for things to get better at a time when the world is in a difficult place, a time of pandemic, a time of rising xenophobia and nationalism and populism. And then we have things like the Deborah Cass Prize. Uh, and we see these incredible shortlisted writers with their myriad of different backgrounds, literally around the globe, coming to this special place that is Australia and being welcomed and then being invited amongst other things to write and to contribute to this prize. That's a thing of hope. It's an incredibly positive uh, thing. It's a creative thing. It's an intellectual thing. It's a thing that opens the imagination. Uh, and I think those who've created this prize, the family, the friends, the acquaintances of Deborah have done something absolutely marvelous. This prize truly honors the Deborah that I know, the Deborah that I knew and loved and who was such a significant part of our lives. And I think she would be absolutely thrilled to be watching this today as all who are so deeply connected with her are. Um, it's a special prize. It creates a special moment. It's an amazing privilege to be part of this conversation today. I'm waiting with bated breath uh, to see who in fact will be crowned uh, with the award of the Deborah Cass Prize 2020. But in a sense, it matters not. What really matters is all of those people who contributed, all of those people who were shortlisted, the act of being part of this growing community, exactly as Rafif put it, people with all sorts of backgrounds, all sorts of histories, all sorts of identities coming together in a single shared community. So I thank the organizers for inviting me. It's an incredible privilege uh, to be part of the conversation. Uh, I hope to be part of it going forward. I send my warm greetings to all of the families uh, and friends from cold, rainy, COVID infested Britain, uh, longing to be in Australia where you seem to be free of this wretched thing to a certain extent. Uh, and now hand back uh, to the organizers and uh, look forward to knowing what will happen in the next few minutes. Thank you so much for inviting me. It's wonderful to be here. Thank you so much, Philippe. Um, uh, we are very privileged to have you. Uh, one of our three judges this year is Lee Kaufman. And in a few moments, Lee's going to speak about this year's entries, uh, announce the two runners up, and of course, the winner. And we'll then hear from our winner and we'll get a reading from their prize winning entry. But first, a brief slideshow introducing you to all nine shortlisted writers who this year hail from Queensland, New South Wales, Victoria and Tasmania. Thanks, Helen.
Hoffman is a Russian-born Israeli author of three fiction books and two memoirs, one of which was shortlisted for Nib Literary Award in 2019. She's an editor and a former academic, she tells me. Uh, her short works have been, uh, have been widely published and her writing has received numerous awards. And I also know her to be a, a very generous and forensic readers, reader of others' unpublished manuscripts and a terrific writer collaborator. And Lee is speaking on behalf of this year's judges. So it's over to you, Lee. Thank you so much, Ellie. I must say it was so moving to see the mm. slide show at the moment, even though I read and reread some of the entries, it still really hits you when you see the beauty of the world's great quotes. It is my absolute pleasure to be presenting the winners of this year's award on behalf of my co-judges, of course, Melanie Cheng and Sison Kim Simon, as well as the prize committee. Now, before I name the winners, I'll say a few words about the shortlist itself. These nine exciting works, which you just tasted a little bit, are diverse in terms of the genres and also the migrant communities they explore. Yet a certain vision echoes across most. I'm talking about a literary attempt to capture the fragmentation of self, typical of migrants throughout history, but even more so nowadays, in our highly mobile world where, when it's not uncommon to move countries more than once, as well as possible to maintain a strong connection with former countries with relative ease, and so migrants often live in a state of flux. Most finalists also paid attention to the many selves migrants hold that go beyond geography, be they sexual, parental, artistic, or other. This to me is a welcome complication of the more traditional narratives that tend to be binary, focusing on the tension between just two identities, both rooted in places, those of departure and destination. The high caliber of shortlisted works made our job of choosing the winner and the two runners up difficult, but we feel that the trio we arrived at have the potential to make a significant contribution to the Australian literary scene. And although unintentionally on our part, they also reflect a diversity of backgrounds and writing styles. And now it's this really exciting moment when I'm going to announce the two runners up. And I'll begin with Dasha Mayorova. In her novel Birch, Dasha takes the migrant experience into two relatively uncharted territories. She reinterprets it in the genre of contemporary Gothic fiction, and she creates a migrant journey that moves in the opposite direction to the literary norm. Her Russian Australian protagonist leaves Australia to go back to St. Petersburg to revisit the metaphorical and possibly literal ghosts of her childhood. Dasha entices us into her story from the very first page through building great suspense and through her assured, polished to a shine prose that shows a fine attention to detail and the wonderful sense of place. The resulting read is absolutely unputdownable. I am thrilled to say that our other runner up is Sahib Nazari. His short story, Alone Together, sits at the very opposite end of the fiction continuum if we compare him to Dasha's story, that of dirty realism. And it is literally abound with dirt, being primarily set in the bloody, pungent environment of a slaughterhouse. But the young Afghani narrator works alongside true blue Aussies. So he makes genuine poetry out of the muck as well as out of the Australian working class slang, which he pitches to perfection. His writing pulsates with humor and raw sensuality, refreshing in its lack of euphemism. And the story unfolds with energy, capturing the protagonist's continuous oscillation between alienation and hard-worn human connection. Oh, it's very exciting. It's the time to announce the winner. <laughs> and I must say, on this winner, we all agreed very fast and very passionately. Anit Mukaji, huge congratulations. We are so excited about your work. At the start of Anit's brilliant story called I'm Full of Love, 
the South Asian Australian protagonist responds to his fellow film student's suggestion to, to make a movie about the, I'm quoting, brown diaspora by saying, I don't want to make something about being brown just because I'm brown. It's all they expect of us. This bold line sets the tone for what is to come, an urgent, defined tale of a compelling, at times exasperating, protagonist who refuses to conform to any norms, positive or negative. Now, all the best stories I know of are thematically complex, mirroring the messiness of real life, yet without losing their coherence. Anit's tale is just that. Being brown surely is a part of it after all, but this is also a story of mental illness, art, loss, sex, and of course, Nick Cave, among all else. Candy, tragicomic, brimming with allusions, and its prose sings, more than sings, it is visceral, strewn with stunning lines such as, I look into his hollow oil eyes, deranged and syphilitic. Here then is a true talent. And now I need, we are eager to hear from you. Congratulations. Wow, thank you. That was, uh, you know, the odd description of how much you just acknowledge in my text has really blown me away. Uh, but before I get into that, I would also like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land I'm on, the Gadigal of the Eora Nation. And secondly, I'd like to give a very humble and sincere thanks and appreciation for the work and the supporters of this award. I truly believe that even in 2020, even in the culture we have now, that the recognition and nourishment of diverse voices, cultural voices is becoming increasingly relevant and important. Uh, as an artist, often you create in a vacuum and you don't know what the hell people think. So to have any kind of recognition, acknowledgement, validation is very humbling and I, I sincerely appreciate this. In terms of this particular story, a lot of the ideas were developed when I was in film school and actively thinking about how to narrativize my culture, my heritage, my background on screen and I couldn't figure it out. So I decided to write about it. To me, that's more immediate. And really the idea I had is simple, but I find it sometimes difficult to articulate, which is that in dealing with complex nuanced experiences, such as in my case, second generational migration, I find it, it really allows you to open up the narrative space if you focus on style and form over the specifics of content. Uh, and to not get too abstract about that, a specific example would be the writings of Jamie Marina Lau or Otessa Moshfeg, whose narrative voice is very immediate, very contemporary, and whose narrative worlds are very rich and personal and highly stylized. And I think this move towards style, literary style, and highly personalized voices is really the path forward for discussions of things like migration when it comes to second generation, third, third generation, and the distinct narrative boundaries become you know, amorphous and undelineated. Um, and in terms of the story, it really came out of a period of frustration where I was stuck in you know, COVID isolation and I had no money and I couldn't get a job. And I was naturally, you know, I, engaging with the works of Marx and Chomsky and reading Thomas Piketty, um, those kinds of thinkers, and really trying to figure out why I have no money, it's real, to simplify the question. And there are systemic answers to that. There are mental health answers to that. There are personal answers to that. But I wasn't interested in the answers. I was more interested in narrativizing that space and creating a character that lived in that realm. 
So in keeping with those ideas, um, I think I'll read a short excerpt, maybe two, uh, and I hope you enjoy it. Patty's naked body presses against mine. I hold her in bed and she's warm underneath the soft cotton blanket. Gently, she kisses me on the cheek. You don't know how to love someone, she whispers into my ear. You don't know what it means to love. In the morning, I put on my clothes and leave the apartment while Patty sleeps. Outside, the air is clean and cold. The streets are not yet busy and I walk around until I find a cafe. I try to buy coffee, but my card is rejected. To hell with everything, I think. My phone buzzes with a call from Patty, but I don't pick up. Instead, I catch a bus back to my place. My whole life is a fucking mess, Ava says without affect. I have zero idea how to function in the world. She plays with her hair and sighs. Why can't you just do nothing with your life, she says. I don't want to have to do things. Ava and I sit in the school's foyer, skipping screenwriting class. Marry me, I reply. We'll move to Paris and write dysfunctional novels. Ava rolls her eyes. You have no money to fly to Paris, she argues back. Besides, the French are annoying. After class, Ava and I walk to the bar. We both order the house red wine and sit outside, watching the construction of a circus in the field nearby. By evening, we are tipsy, and when Ava looks at me, I feel compelled to hold her and kiss her. Her lips are soft, and her spit tastes like cheap wine and cheap tobacco. She places a small hand on my arm, and for a moment, I feel overwhelmingly alone. I pull away, and Ava smiles slightly before closing her eyes and rubbing her nose. I'm still with Jack, she says. You know that. Jack sucks, I reply. You only stay together because you're both too afraid to break up with the other. It's the same between me and Patty, I continue. This way, we both have an excuse. In my room, I lie in bed while Ava undresses. She lies next to me and reaches between my legs. With Ava, there is no issue, and we fuck until our bodies are tired and sore and sweaty. Afterwards, Ava wraps her arms around mine and rests her head on my chest. Now we're both free, she says. In the morning, Ava is gone and I wake up alone. On the pillow next to mine is a handwritten note, forget last night, I am happy with Jack. Above me, I notice a dark, damp spot growing on the ceiling. I crumple the note and throw it ac across the room in the vague direction of my waste basket. It's 8.30 a.m. and class starts in an hour. Fuck it, I think. I'd rather do anything else. But what, I ask myself, what is worth doing? An entire world, a whole life given to me for nothing, and I have zero interest in any of it. It all adds up to nothing. Samantha ran away to help the environment and face the evil of fossil fuel capital until she collapsed exhausted. Jesse smoked weed for a hundred years and melted back into the earth. Rachel lost interest in music and slit her wrists live on 4chan. Jackson became a lawyer and jump, jumped off his penthouse balcony. Mandy wrote poetry no one read and cried silently into the neutral eyes of her 12 rescue cats. Priya joined a hippie cult in the mountains and renounced money for sex. Ashwin stuck a silver needle in his veins and thought he was Coltrane. My father ripped out his own catheter dying from a brain tumor in hospice and blood spurted out his great brown cock enough to drown even his own screams. And here I lie feeling nothing. Thank you. Thank you. It's hard to come off the back of something like that. Extraordinary. Thank you, Anit. Thank you so much. And Tanti Aguri, many, many congratulations to you. Thank you. And so this brings, this brings our 2020 Deborah Cass Prize for writing to a close. Thank you so much for sharing with us this once in a hundred years moment in history. And congratulations again to the runners up, the shortlisted, the longlisted, and every last one of all 106 or 109 entries. And of course, to our winner, Anit Mukaji. See you next year in person, I hope. And here's another little slideshow to see us all off. Thanks, Helen. And good night.